Well, uh, thank you everyone for attending today. I want to take a minute and thank you for that. Uh, I'm Ryan Miller. I'll be moderating this session. I'm a Prof Extension Educator at the University of Minnesota. Uh, and I also have to take a second and thank our uh, sponsorship for today's event, uh, Minnesota SARE. Uh, so they've been instrumental in this. Uh, and this is the 2020 virtual uh, cover crop field day. And much like a field day, uh, we're going to have uh, three shorter presentations, about 20 minutes in length each, and then we're going to follow it with uh, about a half hour discussion at the end of, of the uh, presentations. And so with that, uh, I do want to acknowledge the folks there on the line to present with us today. Uh, first, we're going to have on will be Ethan Lay. He's a graduate student uh, in the Department of Agronomy and Genetics there in St. Paul. Uh, he is going to be covering the um, Cover crops is a weed management tool, a project that was initiated here a while back. Uh, his advisor is Greg Johnson, who's also on the line today, uh, or one of his advisors, uh, and he's an agronomist at the Southern Research and Outreach Center and specialist in cropping systems. Uh, following him, we'll have Axel uh, Garcia, who's uh, from Southern Southwestern Research and Outreach Center, um, and uh, he is. Uh, He's also an agronomist and crop systems specialist. And today he is going to be talking about strategies for inner seeding cover crops and for corn. And so that'll be our second presentation. Third on the list, we have Liz Stahl, who's uh, my counterpart over to the west there and uh, out of Worthington um, in Southwest Minnesota. And she's going to be talking about some work they've been doing on the pros and cons of planting green into cover crop systems. And so those are be our three presentations. Uh, and then during our roundtable session, we're going to actually have Anna Cates, who's a soil health specialist uh, up in the Department of Soil, Water, and Climate. Uh, she is going to be joining us for our roundtable uh, discussion. She is a specialist in the soil health arena. So uh, with that, uh, we are going to get started here today. Uh, we did get one question. I should point that out. So we do, do take questions today. If you look at the bottom of your uh, window you've got open, there's a Q&A. A button. If questions come to mind, you can punch on that Q&A, type in your question, uh, and we'll try to get to those as we get into the, the roundtable discussion session. We did have one question pop up already, and they were uh, inquiring about us recording this presentation, and this will be recorded, and then uh, we uh, have plans to host it on our Cover Crops webpage. So uh, with that, um, so we don't get delayed here, Ethan. I think we're going to have you uh, start sharing your screen and then uh, present on your topic. And uh, the rest of us are going to disappear from the video stream here. All right. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, like Ryan said, my name is Ethan Lay, and I'm a grad student at the Minneapolis-St. Paul Twin Cities campus for the University of Minnesota. And today I will be talking about the trade-offs between cover crops and weed management. So more specifically along the sides of cover crops and weed management, we are focused on late emerging weeds and more specifically water hemp. And why water hemp? Well, so to list a few things, water hemp for starters has a really bad herbicide resistance problem. So it is resistant to group two, group nine, and group 14 herbicides, which makes it very problematic to control throughout the season. Another problem we have is extended emergence. As you can see on the graph here, water hemp at the bottom emerges between May to late July, which means it's a very difficult problem for growers to control when it comes later in the season. Another problematic weed is also giant ragweed, which has an emergence pattern between April and June. But with other Tactics you can get around uh, controlling that with delayed planting and other programs. Um, another problem with water hemp we have is a very persistent seed bank. So this is some weed science data for various weeds. And as you can see, common water hemp there is very persistent in the seed bank year after year compared to other grasses and broadleaf weeds. Another problem we have is its seed production and yield loss com competition. Um, these graphs just show that as it emerges, it is very persistent and produces a lot of 
seeds and can be very problematic to the grower. As long as if you do not control this weed early, it will have a lot of effects on your subsequent crop. So those are the kind of some big issues surrounding why water hemp is so hard to control. And that brings up a study that we are doing in partnership with the Minnesota Department of Ag, and that is addressing trade-offs between weed management for late emerging weeds species and integration of cover crops using a systems approach. So the scope of this experiment was to see if there is damage on fall applied herbicides to spring cover crop biomass. And so the three herbicides programs we are looking at are Resicor, Verdict, and Outlook. And these are some common herbicides provided that are aimed to have good water hemp control. Um, Resicor is gonna be your herbicide with the longest soil residual, Verdict having a mediocre, and then Outlook having the shortest soil residual life. And then we are pairing that with um, winter rye, red clover, and camelina as our cover crops to be studied. And that includes your grass, legume, and brassica. This experiment is done in three site locations over this year and then next year as well. And those are Rosemount, Wasika, and Rochester. And within those, with those three sites, we're incorporating um, three different soil textures. So Rosemount, we have a silt loam soil, Rochester, we have a sandy loam, and then Wasika has a clay loam. So kind of the, some bigger questions we're trying to answer with this experiment is, we wanna see if there's a need for control of late emerging weeds. We wanna see if we can integrate cover crops into a system. We wanna see the role of cover crops for suppression of early emerging weeds. And we also wanna see if soybean yield influences by cover crop. Oh, let me go back here. Um, before I get into showing this next slide, it is preliminary data um, just to show what we've saw after a first year of this experiment. Um, no statistical analysis or anything has been done, um, but we just wanted to show some preliminary data and findings that we've come across. So this is the spring biomass data for all three sites that was just collected this past spring. And it was overall a great year for um, biomass accumulation. And as you can see on the graphs, uh, the cereal rye did perform the best as you know, you could probably understand. Um, it's a great cover crop, but also the camelina and red clover performed really well. And also across the three graphs, it appears that there was not much difference on um, impact of herbicide. Um, and we'll kind of explain that why that might be. Um, we have a question about what the y-axis is. So the y-axis is the amount of biomass produced. Um, I want to say kilograms per hectare is the measurement that we are using. So it just shows large amounts of biomass were produced in the spring. And as I said that we, it appears that there wasn't much of a pre-herbicide impact on the cover crops. And there's a lot of things that go into play when it comes to the effectiveness of soil residual herbicides. And this slide highlights those. Um, so you have soil factors, climate factors, management, and other herbicide properties that all come into play that can affect the pre-herbicide and program. So some things off the bat was we had a very wet year compared to normal. And this, these graphs just show the amount of rainfall that we observed last spring in 2019. And with that increased rainfall, more rainfall increased the amount of soil microbial activity, which could have potentially degraded the herbicide, which in turn, lessens its effect on the cover crops. Again, this is all preliminary data and findings. So this is just one area that could have impacted the study, but there 
are so many things that could have impacted the effectiveness of the herbicide. That is one reason why we are doing this study is we are trying to find what factors, if any, can affect these relationships. And then these are weed densities and heights we took this summer. Um, and it appears in this study that the cover crops did a great job at controlling their giant ragweed with just a few in each quadrat and the heights were very small. But it also didn't seem to have much of a control on the water hemp, which the water hemp has a later emerging pattern, as we know. The giant ragweed is much sooner. And so the preliminary data suggests that we are able to provide some early season control, but we are still working on that late emergence control. So just a few take home messages to summarize everything I've said. Um, controlling the late emerging weed species such as water hemp or other late emergers such as Powell amaranth may still allow us to establish cover crops in the fall, but more work is needed to truly answer that question. That is why this experiment is going another year and might provide us some more information and details. Also, the choice of cover crop can have a significant effect on control of early emerging weed species the following spring. And what we don't understand is the influence of herbicide injury from the previous fall or spring on weed control and more data is needed and more experiments will need to be conducted. And that is all I have. Are there any right. questions? Thanks, Ethan. Yeah, you're um, welcome. We don't see any questions right now on the Q&A box, but it, again, a reminder of something came to mind as far as a question you'd like to ask Ethan or maybe a point of discussion later when we start a round table. Uh, please take a couple seconds and, uh, and type those into the Q&A. But seeing that the, we currently don't have any in the bank there, I think uh, we're going to uh, stop sharing there. Well, actually, we got a quick one. Uh, and Mark Shatsky is asking, when were your covers planted and how were they terminated? So the covers were planted in mid-September of 2018 and then overwintered, and then they were terminated with a burn down application of glyphosate. I hope that answers your question, Mark. Yep. And I think that does. And so um, we're going to save the next question for the discussion period. But with that, Ethan, we're going to stop sharing your okay. screen and move over to Axel uh, so he can share his, uh, his talk on uh, strategies for uh, interceding cover crops in the Okay, thank you very much. And uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for attending our virtual uh, cover crops field day. Uh, we were supposed to be at least in Lumberton the, today. And by the way, it's a beautiful, uh, really day for a real field day. So that's not possible. And uh, we had to face that challenge. Um, so I'm going to be talking today uh, about strategies for interceding cover crops into corn. Uh, I would like to acknowledge my co-authors, uh, Liz Stahl and Alexis Giangrande. Uh, Liz is, uh, is uh, my colleague at the University of Minnesota. She is an, uh, an extension educator in the crops team. And Alexis Giangrande is uh, my technician. And so we work together in this, in this core crop related things. Well, let's uh, get started. Um, I've been showing this, uh, this slide you guys have in front of you right now. Um, and I wanted to just to emphasize what cover crops means uh, to what I do, okay? So basically cover crops are crops uh, that are planted between two cash crops uh, to provide uh, agroecological services. And when we say agroecological services, we are talking on protecting the soil against uh, you know, erosion, at least to reduce erosion. Uh, reducing also uh, nitrogen nitrate in leachate and so on, you know. So that, that covers with that definition what the cover crop is for us. But also, let me see if I can use the pointer. Uh, cover crops are not intended to be harvested and are terminated before the next uh, cash crop is planted. And this is really very uh, important to 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 for what I do because 
we've been, and I said we because I've been doing it as well, we've been doing to try uh, to, try to develop uh, what we are calling uh, cash cover crops, which uh, from my perspective, that really doesn't exist. Um, because cover crops shouldn't be, you know, for for economical benefit benefit at least directly. And uh, last but not least, uh, the beauty of the cover crops is that uh, their biomass is returned to the soil, and uh, and then that means we are going to recycle nutrients that uh, those cover crops have used to produce uh, uh, the bi their biomass. Anyway, so today I'm going to be talking about what we have so far done, uh, what are we doing, and then final remarks. So it's, I'm going to go through the first part um, a little bit quickly because I've been talking about that for the last two, three years. And then I'm going to show you, hopefully I will transition you into what we think could be something that is worth, uh, you know, doing research you know uh in more detail so we make sure that our core crops uh, can be used for conditions here in the state of minnesota and overall in the upper midwest so uh, one of the very early studies we did was to try to see if we could use winter oilseed crops as cover crops and when i say winter oilseed crops i am talking on winter camelina and field penny cress so um Probably at this point, uh, all of you attending this uh, this field day, virtual field day, already know what camelina and pennycress are. Well, first I will start with the with pennycress. Pennycress, until recent years, it was uh, considered um, a weed, you know, and you know, for practical purposes, is is still a weed uh, for for producers. And winter camelina is an basically an ancient crop that uh, was brought to our attention just recently for this part of the world. Both are from the Brassica family and they have very good oil content in the grain and uh, most importantly they are tolerant to our weather conditions. So we can see the winter camelina and feed penny cress in the, in the fall. They will overwinter and uh, in the next spring they are going to resume growth and if they keep going eventually you can harvest uh, the grain that uh, can be used for biofuel and other purposes and that is going to happen somewhere by the end of June. Uh, but we wanted to know whether or not these two uh, winter oil seed crops could be used as cover crops, okay? So that means seeded in the fall and in the next, ne next spring to terminate them uh, before to go ahead and plant corn and soybeans again. So we did that. We already published some, a couple of papers related to that. Uh, this is one of them, but basically uh, our most important findings was that fall biomass of both winter oilseed crops is marginal. Compared to cereal rye, both winter oilseed crops had higher tissue nitrogen, which is, let's say, good, uh, but produced significantly lower biomass, which means even though uh, they were able to scavenge more nitrogen uh, because the, f the very little biomass that was produced, that was not really very significant. Winter camelina had significantly higher spring biomass and accumulated, accumulated more nitrogen than pennycress. And uh, the good thing is that corn yield was significantly, the, the bad thing, I'm sorry, is the corn yield was significantly decreased while soybean yield was not affected uh, by the use of these two winter oil seed crops. Uh, and uh, quickly, I wanted to show you some of our results here, and I wanted to bring to your, att uh, to your attention, uh, well, this is the above ground biomass. This is the nitrogen concentration in the tissue. This is the nitrogen content. This is in kilograms per hectare, and this is the carbon nitrogen ratio. This is 2016, this is 2017. Uh, this is uh, following corn and uh, following soybeans. And, uh, but I wanted to show you the amount of nitrogen that uh, we found during this study in 16 and 17 uh, with corn and soybeans. Uh, you can see here for winter uh, camelina, which was one of our, was our control, we got around 
between 14 to 15 kilograms per hectare. That's more or less 16 pounds per acre. Uh, field penny crest less than four and uh, winner rye uh, 31. Okay, in 2017, uh, winner, winner rye was 36. Uh, winner camelina was, winner camelina and field penny crest, they, they had more or less uh, 10 uh, kilograms per hectare. In 20, with soybeans, they did a little bit better. We can, uh, in sometimes we, you see here, winter camelina got, uh, had 22 uh, kilograms per hectare. And also in 2017, uh, 21. So that was a little bit more consistent. Well, the, the overall, uh, I would say that uh, if we use winter camelina and field penny crest as cover crops, we might be uh, trapping into those two crops tissue around 20, 25 uh, pounds per acre of nitrogen that otherwise uh, will be lost in the system. I mean, we'll go into the, uh, you know, as a, in the leachate or things like that. Another thing that is interesting here is the carbon nitrogen ratio. The carbon nitrogen ratio was all around uh, very low. So it is, it is interesting because it means that basically uh, the tissue of these cover crops is going to decompose pretty quickly. And this, uh, well, we can say that um, if it's not going to decompose during the fall, but it's gonna happen just in the spring, uh, it will probably happen and we have already some data showing us that it will happen um, within uh, more or less in the first 30 to 45 days. So that means when uh, corn is around V2 to V3. Let me see now, uh, but this is the thing, very, very little nitrogen was found in the tissue of these two crops, but we have a new study that we are conducting and we see here that camelina in this case responds very well to nitrogen. That is specific for camelina. So we did that because camelina also is being considered, both crops actually are being considered, uh, you know, in the, in the corn soybean rotation as a third crop. So we are able to get three crops in two years. Uh, while this is promising, at the same time, it's something that we should think a little bit more, uh, sh we should study a little bit more because we will have to put a little bit more nitrogen into the system to, to, be, uh, uh, to make sure that uh, we will be able to get, you know, um, a good uh, productivity of this camelina. So it is interesting that it responds very well to, to, to nitrogen, but if you put it where without fertilizer, it will produce very little. Okay, another study we did was uh, related to early and late interseeded cover crops. Uh, and we wanted to see how that will affect corn productivity. So we already uh, published that paper, that, that, those results as well. And basically what we found is that uh, early and late interseeded cover crops into corn have no effect uh, on yield of, uh, of, of corn, right? And also fall biomass of cover crops is marginal. It was marginal. This, this is a, the picture you see here is during the fall. You, you, may, you, you can quickly imagine how much biomass we are gonna get uh, in a field like this. Uh, also, one of the issues is that the synchronization of cover crops management with weather conditions is one of the major challenges we have been seeing during the years. And last, um, cover crops should be given the opportunity to grow. What I'm trying to say with that is, um, if we are gonna have a cover crop that overwinters, and uh, we are gonna follow with corn or soybeans after that in the next spring, um, it, it would be better if we try to keep that cover crop as long as we can at field without obviously, you know, uh, reducing or penalizing too much our corn and soybeans. But uh, you know, the University of Minnesota has done a lot of research about uh, planting dates and yields of corn and soybeans. And if we, are, if we plant those two crops around the 15th, 20th of May, we might have a penalization of more or less five to 6% in both crops. So the thing is the following, uh, those five, 6% are highly variable and actually vary for less than more. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that it all depends on, on the year as well. So if we give the cover crops the opportunity to grow for a little bit more longer than just terminated them by the end of April, we might be able to quite easily double the amount of biomass that they produce in 10, 15 days. Okay, uh, we also know uh, that uh, 
cover crops help reducing uh, the nitrogen, the nitrate concentration in the in the in the vichate. So we did this study during three years at three locations in Grand Rapids, Lumberton, and Wasika, and we use cereal rye and cereal rye combined with uh, crimson clover and then combined with uh, crimson clover and forage radish. So basically what you can see here is that uh, the, the purple bar is the no cover. So you can see that uh, in general, the, pulp, the purple bar shows higher concentration of nitrogen, which means more nitrogen went through the soil uh, profile all the way to more or less one meter uh, deep here. It's just uh, 38, 40 inches deep, okay? So, and while if we use cover crops, we might be able to reduce that concentration at that deep, okay, depth, okay? So, and that is uh, quite, uh, is repeated uh, quite often, which is good, but as, at the same time, you see that there is a lot of, uh, of uh, variability. It, it varies a lot, okay? And it varies because several reasons, and uh, that's not the, the objective of this talk today, but one of the reasons is that it's very hard to get cover crops established sometimes for conditions in, in Minnesota. Also, uh, we have uh, cover crops early interseeded into corn, and you can see that we had basically no effect uh, on yield of corn during those two years, and that, uh, that work was published as well. And I'm going to rush a little bit because I am scared that I might go over too much over the time. And uh, if we had corn uh, late interseeded, you can see as well that basically there is no differences between the different uh, treatments we had at three locations and different cover crop treatment. This is onion ryegrass with crimson clover and forage radish, and this is cereal rye with uh, uh, crimson clover and forage radish. No difference. So there is no effect of, uh, of cover crops on yield of corn and soybeans. Then we also use cover crops combined with tillage practices to try to determine if cover crops will do better and whether or not the, the yield of corn will be affected. And again, no effect, okay? So that's a good news from the, from the perspective of yield produ uh, corn yield productivity, but uh, the growth, I mean, of cover crops is very, it was, was very marginal doing it this way. Okay, that takes me to the second part of this uh, uh, presentation, which is uh, a study we started with uh, Liz Stahl uh, last year, which is timing uh, for early interceding cover crops into corn. So what we did here was uh, we started uh, with this on May the 1st, and uh, we, we, had, we planted corn on May the 1st, then we planted uh, annual ryegrass and uh, crimson clover at V2, V4, and V6 corn. This is the first uh, seeding of cover crops was seeded on May 1st along with corn. You can see here anor rye with corn and crimson clover with uh, corn as well. So anor rye and crimson clover, they really took over the corn very quickly. That's, uh, that, was, that picture was taken on May the 30th. So then um, if we go to uh, June the 6th, that was 36 days after planting. This is how it looked like. So you see that, that the annual ryegrass has really grown a lot and similar for the um, crimson clover. We keep going 43 days after, after seeding. Uh, this is how this was looking uh, like. So basically corn was already pretty stressed in this treatment as compared to the to the no cover, which I not, I'm not showing here, but because it just looked very well as any other, uh, you know, cornfield. And this is how it looked like with uh, the crimson clover. 50 days after seeding, this is what we got. So corn was really behind in both uh, with onion ryegrass and uh, the crimson clover. And we already had the second, uh, the second seeding, which was on June the 2nd at V2 corn, that looked like this and looked like this as well. So 18 days after seeding these ones here. So later in July the 4th, so we already had uh, seeding at V2, V4 and along with corn. So if you can see here, this is um, the onion ryegrass and this is the crimson clover we, we, we seeded along with uh, corn planting. So this is a little bit more than two months after seeding. 
and maybe I don't know if you can see it, but the corn was really very short when we seeded uh, the cover crops along with the planting of the corn. So, and the seeding of cover crops at before was almost nothing, you know, just coming up, you know, 19 days after seeding. So later in August 15, which is uh, for the first planting more than 100 days after seeding, uh, animal rye was already senescent, senescing you know, and crimson clover as well. You can see here that uh, the crimson clover, the first seeding is already, is, has already changed color, it is senescing, but in the second seeding at the V2 corn, it's starting, starting to flower here. And then uh, when we seeded, seeded at V4 and at V6, basically not much difference. And similar for the animal rye. In, in most of the time, this is because uh, shade tolerance, tolerance uh, issues. So I want to show you quickly this. This is uh, how it looked like um, 73, 73 days after seeding the, with annual, uh, the annual rye grass into corn. And this is the control and this is the crimson clover. But I wanted to show you, uh, we had here uh, almost 3,000 pounds of dry matter per acre of uh, annual rye grass and more than uh, 3,300, almost 3,400 pounds of dry matter of uh, crimson clover under the corn here. Corn was pretty stressed in both cases. And uh, these graphs show you basically the height of the corn with uh, annual rye grass planted at the same time, and the height of the corn control, and the height of the corn with crimson clover seeded at the same time as well. You can see that the difference between the control and, uh, and uh, the, the one that had the cover crop is very high. We, while this does not relate directly to yield, because what we are seeing in the background here, we know that our yield is going to be uh, penalized in this case. And this is uh, the, the second seeding of cover crops. You can see that this a little bit here, nothing here is the control, and a little bit here for the crimson clover. And here, at, um, here we had around 500 and uh, 600 pounds of dry biomass in both in both uh, cover crops. In terms of height, again, what you can see is that height was basically the same for all three: the control, the one with city. Um, annual rye grass and the one with crimson clover. So it is uh, it's a staggering difference. Uh, if we plant uh, cover crops along with the corn, basically is a recipe for failure. And I guess this is one of my last uh, um, slides. That's what I wanted to show here is that we are also doing summer, summer cover crops uh, for prevent planting. We hope not to see prevent planting issues again, but in case we never know, we are testing some of uh, some uh, summer cover crops such as uh, sorghum sudan grass, permillet, teff, and others. I just put these two here, which are the ones that perform the best. But you can see we compare with crimson clover, with cereal rye, with oat, and then a combination of the first three. And also then um, we had forage uh, radish alone, teff, permillet, and sorghum. So it is incredible how much growth this uh, permillet and sorghum can have. It's a lot, okay? And this growth uh, occurred from July 12th, which was the planting, uh, to the end of August of, of last year. And we are doing that again this year and results are not gonna be this different. Uh, probably we are gonna have better uh, forage radish yields than th that we have in 2019. So this is, this is very interesting, but these, these summer cover crops produce a lot of biomass. You know, during the last uh, 10 or so days, they were producing uh, per millet and sorghum sudan grass. They were making more than 450 pounds a day in an acre. That's what they were, they were doing in terms of biomass. So their growth is really incredible. So my final remark is that uh, climate, um, or weather, if you wish, um, is the most important uh, factor that affects 
the success of cover crops using Minnesota. And uh, I'm saying that because, because our conditions, we have a very narrow growing season. So it is the opportunity for us to establish cover, to seed cover crops and get established. And then we have also issues in the spring. If we have a winter kill cover crop that we have, to, we, uh, an, uh, another winter cover crop that we want to terminate it. So if we are not, how to say, uh, just uh, ready looking at the weather forecast, we might miss the opportunity to proper, properly terminate the, the cover crop. So early and late interseeded cover crops, including winter all seed crops, have basically a little to no effect on yield of corn and soybeans. Um, that's a good news, but uh, we would like to see more growth. So the more growth, uh, the better is going to be the benefit we, we expect to have from those cover crops. And yes, cover crops reduce nitrate in the leachate, but the integration of, of other practices uh, might be needed to effectively reach uh, our environmental goals. Um, I'm saying that because cover crops alone, uh, from my perspective, are, are not the solution. We have to look for integrated, uh, for an integrated uh, uh, strategy to to be able to, uh, to, to be more sustainable. Um, and also summer crops grow very fast. So we have to be very careful when it comes to uh, terminate them. And last but not least, uh, I would like to emphasize that uh, it would be good if we consider uh, giving cover crops a chance, uh, a chance to grow. Um, just uh, 10 or so more days uh, makes a huge difference in terms of the amount of biomass that uh, those cover crops are going to are going to produce and that that really will make a big difference as well. So that's what I have for you today. And uh, if there is some questions now or later, I'll be more than glad to try to address them. Thank you. Well, thank, thanks, Axel. And, and we did have a question come in, but I think we're gonna save it for the round table portion that's, of the, uh, the session here today. So again, okay. remind, reminder folks, uh, if you do have a question that comes to mind or you want to have some discussion around some point that Axel was addressing or, or any of our speakers for that matter, you can find that Q&A tab in the middle of the uh, bottom of your browser screen there. Uh, punch that, open it up, and then you can type in your question and we will get to those uh, as we move through the program here today. Uh, with that, we want to thank Axel and then we want to move on to our third speaker, uh, for today before we uh, we move into our roundtable discussion. And with that, uh, we'd like to welcome Liz Stahl on board here. If she wants to start, uh, unmute yourself, Liz. She's gonna be addressing the pros and cons of planting green um, into a cover crop. Um, anyway, yeah, thanks Ryan and thanks everybody. I just wanted to highlight one of the projects that uh, I've been working on too with with Axel Garcia, he Garcia and uh, Alexis Giagrande as well. And it's something that we've had a number of questions on and, and it's about planting green, just kind of focusing around that. So I just wanted to hit on kind of some of the pros and cons of planting green. And there we go. So again, if we look at, you know, some of the potential advantages, there's a number of advantages, you know, potentially planting green. Um, of course, you, the key thing here is you're allowing more cover crop growth. So you can get more benefits from that cover crop. Uh, so you can have more potential erosion control benefits because you're getting cover longer. Uh, if you're in a dry year, you know, that, that uh, increased biomass can potentially help increase with moisture retention, you know, even after that co cover crop's terminated. Uh, do have a greater potential for weed suppression, again, because you're having a greater amount of growth. There's a Nice, you know, it, it really relates to um, biomass production, you know, how much weed suppression you can get from a cover crop. Uh, also increases your diversity. You know, here we're pr predominantly corn soybean rotation, getting another crop in that system. Again, just helps add diversity to the whole system. Can help build soil organic matter and structure. Um, it's a potential to help reducing compaction. You know, people talk about being able to drive out onto fields uh, earlier in the season that had a cover crop versus that didn't. Um, as Axel showed too, with nutrient retention, you know, the up ability to take up uh, nitrates, for example, as well. And again, you know, we can increase that microbial and, and insect diversity, but, you know, there's some potential disadvantages to planting green as well. Um, if you have a lot of biomass out there, a lot of residue might create some more challenges in planting. You have to be able to uh, be able to, you know, get through that biomass, you know, how is your planter set up uh, and so forth. Uh, if you're in a drought year, 
you have a lot of uh, biomass production, you know, you could uh, potentially, you know, have a moisture issue uh, that it could be robbing moisture from the crop. Uh, again, if that crop stays around or the cover crops too long with your cash crop, uh, could potentially delay crop emergence, you know, with cooler soil temperatures as well, again, with that increased coverage. Um, and in some cases might potentially reduce your cash crop emergence. You know, people talk about allelopathy a lot of times, uh, and especially like with cereal rye, that is something, you know, way back when I was in grad school too, we were talking about allelopathy back then, something that's very tough to uh, quantify. Um, sometimes, you know, you can pick that up, but it's, it's a tough thing to really count on. A lot of times uh, that might just be related to nitrogen too. It's just, uh, you know, the crop when it's breaking down or that cover crop breaking down is, is, is uh, tying up nitrogen instead of giving it to your crop or making it available to that. But again, uh, that if there is, uh, there are some allelopathic chemicals that can be uh, exuded from residues as they break down that might affect, you know, crop emergence, potentially other pests like sea corn maggot, uh, slugs that could be uh, plus or minus depending on, you know, again, there's research being done on that as well. Um, and again, this nitrogen availability might be a concern. Uh, we were just talking about the this morning about like, uh, you know, volunteer cover crops could be an issue too. A lot of these cover crops, you know, they have some dormancy in the seed. We're used to corn and soybeans. You plant them, they come up this year. Uh, where a cover crop, you can have dormancy and they may not all come up this year. You might have some of that seed emerging, you know, next season. Um, so again, something that you have to deal with uh, if you don't want them out in your field at that time. Um, also, uh, if you're using pre-emergence herbicides, which we definitely uh, promote the use of that, especially when you're dealing with water hemp, uh, if you have a lot of biomass out there that could uh, uh, interfere with that ability that pre-emergence herbicide to get to the soil. And of course, you know, there's potential impacts on, on your crop yield as well. So um, again, just to take a little step back, when we're talking about planting green, um, basically, you know, we're talking about planting that cash crop into a living cover crop. Some people might, you know, terminate like the day before or day around, but basically, again, it's into a, a, a living cover crop. Now, generally, when we talk about cover crops for years, you know, we've been talking about terminating that cover crop 10 to 14 days prior to planting the cash crop. Um, that's just, again, been kind of the general recommendation, but that's certainly, you know, especially up here too in, in, in Minnesota, doesn't allow much time for cover crop growth and really, you know, limits the benefits that you could potentially get from your cover crop just because you have so much limitation of growth. Um, so, Let's see, Phyllis, if you can be the master. Thank you. <laughs> I do have a question for you. If you, um, I think you just need to click on here. I uh, just wanted to know, um, have you planted green or worked with growers who have done so? And here you can select more than one. So um, see, we're getting some answers rolling and just curious to see where everybody is at here. We're seeing the soybeans winning so far. <laughs> Okay, maybe that's about what we'll get for responses here today. So again, but yeah, about 51% of people have planted green and soybean, but 32% in corn. Um, and uh, some that are planting cover crops that haven't planted green, but then also others that just haven't planted cover crops. Okay, that's, that's good to, interesting to know. I'll keep going, there we go. Uh, so yeah, that's good to know. But um, yeah, one of the things with planting green and Axel touched on this issue as well too when uh, he was talking about interseeding the cover crops, you know, really key weed science principle that I always think about weed science is my background um, and it applies of course when you're looking at weed competition, the same principles relate to when we're talking about competition from a cover crop. Um, and basically, you know, we're talking about that critical period for weed control. Uh, if you look at this side of the graph here, here we're looking at, you know, potential crop yield. Um, when we are seeding, you know, or planting green, uh, actually, you know, this normally talks about, um, you know, something emerging with the crop, but when we're planting green, we actually have a head start on that crop. Uh, but so again, planting green, that's that period of time from when that cover crop can stay with the cash crop before it starts to hurt yield. Um, so we want to get rid of that cover crop before it has, you know, too much of an impact on our cash crop yield. Well, on the flip side, when Axel's talking about like interseeding the cover crop, 
now we're talking about, okay, when can we put in that cover crop um, where it won't impact yield? You know, if we see too early, that's on this lower graph. Uh, if we see too early and it stays with our cash crop, it's going to impact yield. We want to seed it late enough that it won't have an impact on yield. So again, that's a real key thing when we're talking about, you know, planting green. We want to uh, be able to get that the cover crop out of there before we have too much of a yield impact on our cash crop. Um, now, so a little bit of background, then we, uh, we initiated this cover crop termination timing trial, worked again with this with uh, Axel and Alexis out at the Southwest Research and Outreach Center in Lamberton. Uh, luckily, Axel had um, a stand of cereal rye out at Lamberton, and he'd seeded it at different dates. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a little bit here. But um, anyway, we're fortunate we, we had some questions coming in, particularly from people planting cover crops that said, hey, you know, you're killing us saying, you know, to wait 10 to 14 days uh, before, you know, you can plant after terminating that cover crop. We're just not getting enough production. So we thought, well, let's try um, you know, with the one seeding date of cereal rye and then look at three different termination timings in corn and beans. And we'll just see, you know, we're doing real basics like what kind of biomass coverage do we get and then what kind of impact uh, might we potentially see it yield at the end. So uh, we looked at, a, it's worked in a cereal rye uh, that was seeded September 6th at 60 pounds per acre, uh, was seeded with a Penn State interseeder. Uh, and then this spring, we had three different termination dates. It was, it was uh, terminated with cornerstone uh, active ingredients, glyphosate, just like with Roundup. And our first termination timing was we were targeting like 10 to 14 days prior to planting. Here's the actual date. Um, and then our second timing was at planting is what we were targeting. Um, and then the third one was about a week after planting. So we actually planted our corn and soybeans on the 12th of May. Uh, here's the information about seeding rate and varieties and hybrids. And we collected cover crop biomass and percent cover with this program, Canopia. Uh, that's just a little app. It looks at the ground cover and estimates, you know, again, percent ground cover without having to actually, you know, uh, take off the plant material. But we did, again, collect crop biomass at termination. And then we're taking information on the crop. And ultimately, you know, this fall we'll get grain yield and moisture at harvest. So you can see kind of how those little plots laid out. And the nice thing, you know, I know we talk about these virtual field days, it's, it'd be nice to be out there in the actual field, but we can do some time traveling here with a virtual field day. Uh, we can be back in the plots here on May 21st. And this is what they look like um, with that first termination date. You can see the cereal rye, not a lot of biomass uh, at that point. Again, we terminated that, you know, on, on um, you know, the end of, oh, what is it? <laughs> at April 30th. Um, and then our second termination date um, here, it's still dying yet because again, I took these pictures on uh, May 21st, but you know, a little more biomass. And then the third termination date, we are certainly seeing more biomass being generated at that time. Now, if we go ahead into June, seeing what's uh, left, you know, because that's one thing you wonder, well, how long does it take for this biomass to break down? Uh, that first termination date, um, you really can't see a lot of rye biomass. Uh, and these are the corn plots, the corn and soybean plots, you know, uh, look pretty much the same. So I just am showing the, the corn plots here. But, you know, and, and a lot of that can be soybean residue too. So again, it's not really evident we had a cover crop necessarily there. Um, and that second termination date, now we are seeing more of the rye biomass still being present. present. And then the third termination timing, we are still seeing, you know, some of that rye biomass uh, being present at that time. Now we go into uh, July, and this is what they look like on the 13th. Here again, not a lot of residue being ev evident on the ground, uh, but that rye is where we headed in, in the beginning. You know, we are still seeing that hold through at least through July and, and potentially, you know, from a weed control standpoint, again, and, uh, you know, weed science background, wondering can this help us maybe in, inhibit germination a little bit of some later emerging weeds, possibly, you know, give us a little bit of benefit there. Uh, could certainly help keep uh, retain moisture, which we want, you know, later on the season usually, um, and, and so forth. So again, what kind of impacts could that have? Plus, giving us a little protection of the soil too. So if you look at uh, the results, and again, these are preliminary results. So we haven't ran all the statistics on this yet, but you can see uh, how much biomass was generated. Uh, so this is pounds of dry matter per acre. 
uh, and the corn and soybean virtually, you know, the same. Uh, but, you know, when we did that first, that early termination timing, you see that we're generating not quite 600 pounds uh, of dry matter per acre. Uh, if we waited to terminate until May 11th, now we almost doubled that amount of biomass that was generated. Um, and if we waited till May 20th, you know, we increased it again as well. Now, statistically, uh, again, we haven't ran all the stats on this yet. The last two termination dates may not be statistically different. There's, you know, variability. That's what these bars are. That's showing you the error. But certainly, you know, these are generating more biomass than that first termination timing. Um, and then if we look to the right here, the ground cover that goes along with biomass production, we are getting more ground cover uh, where we had, you know, the later termination timings versus that early uh, termination timing. And one of the take homes from this too is that basically, you know, to optimize our cover crop growth, uh, it's really, you know, at least this year, but uh, I don't think it's a whole lot different from some other years. We needed to delay that termination until around mid-May. Um, so if you think about that, again, this is looking at the pros and cons of planting green. If you want to terminate that cover crop in the middle of May or later, um, you know, look at your planting date as well. Um, because if you're going to plant, you know, real early in the season, and, and again, as agronomists always promote, you know, planting as soon as the soil conditions are fit, but it's all about trade-offs too. We don't want that cover crop to be around with the cash crop too long or we're going to have, you know, a lot of competition going on. So, you know, a thing you could look at is potentially planting a little bit later, um, but I wouldn't want to go too late. This is data taken off of our uh, Extension Crops website. Uh, information, a lot of this was generated at Lamberton, our long-term data looking at planting date effects on corn yield. Um, this is also some trials done by Jeff Coulter at the University of Minnesota. But you'll see, you know, again, that key window for planting corn is usually that last week of April, first week of May, where we see optimal yields. Uh, of course, it varies in a given year, but that's our long-term averages. Uh, but if we, you know, even if we plant, say, around May 10th, you know, we're typically not seeing a big hit on yield. Get to May 15th, and eh, now we're starting to see some more reductions. So again, it's all about trade-offs. If you want to maximize your cover crop biomass production, you know, what are you willing to trade off on corn yield potential? If you're going to try this in corn, uh, in soybean, here again, planting early, uh, May 1st, that's generally where we, you know, say that's where we optimize yields. Uh, soybeans, of course, respond to planting date as well. But, you know, if we delayed planting a little bit, um, you know, are we willing to take that trade off to get more cover crop biomass uh, so we could terminate a little bit later too. Uh, so again, just kind of looking at those potential impacts if we did want to delay planting a little bit as well. Um, so um, other things to look at with planting green too. Uh, a big issue here is just that green bridge for pests that we talk about. Uh, and basically what we're talking about with that is when you have a pest that the host range uh, for the cover crop is the same with a cash crop. If we don't have that 10 to 14 day window, um, you know, where we typically said, you know, you had to terminate 10 to 14 days ahead of cash crop planting. If that window's not there, the pest can go right into your cash crop. So an example here would be like true armyworm. Uh, this is a picture from uh, Claire Lacan sent me this, uh, this spring. And yeah, this is an armyworm. You can bet there's a pretty significant yield impact uh, in this field. That's from a rye uh, cover crop and the arm, you know, once, well, what happens with true armyworm, you know, the moths come up uh, from down south, they're attracted to green vegetation, you know, grasses or weedy areas too. But if you have like, say, a rye cover crop growing, attracted to that, they'll lay their eggs, larva will hatch. If you don't have a window uh, in between where you terminate that cover crop and, and, their cover, and your cash crops emerging, they'll go right on into the cash crop. So not a very common pest yet, but you know, as more people try this, maybe that will change. Um, you know, so again, it's something to really be on the lookout for. So again, true armyworm, common stock borer, black cutworm, these are all pests that could be you know, uh, increased if we you know, have that green bridge issue, as well as sea corn maggot, wireworms, white grubs, slugs. Again, those are all things that people are um, you know, to be more on alert. 
of uh, Bruce Potter at the Southwest Research and Outreach Center. He is involved with a North Central Region uh, trial across different states, and they're looking at the impact of planting green on, on insect pests too. So um, be interested to see what they all find out with that. Uh, so anyway, I did say I wanted to jump back to this too, because we've looked at some of the issues that can affect planting green, you know, potential impacts. Another thing, uh, when you're trying to maximize or optimize the amount of biomass produced, you know, look at seeding date. Um, and again, this is really cool how this was set up. Again, at, at uh, Axel had this set up uh, at, at Lamberton, and basically they seeded the cereal rye at four different dates last fall. So the seeding date one, that was on September 6th. This is on September 17th. This was on September 26th, and this was seeded October 8th. And uh, now this is the amount of biomass, just pictorially, you know, what you saw on May 21st. All these are pretty similar, but certainly, you know, that October 8th seeding date, a lot less biomass production at that time. So uh, seeding date does matter. You know, if you can get your cereal rye seeded by, you know, about mid-September, mid you're going to be optimizing that uh, biomass production. And this is just looking again at the results of that, again, preliminary analysis. But... Here's our different seeding dates uh, in the fall and the amount of biomass that was produced. Uh, it's interesting if you look at that last seeding date, uh, all three of these termination dates, even if we delayed terminating until May 20th, we're still not quite, or it's, you know, it's about that same biomass production of the earliest termination timing for those, you know, earlier seeding dates. So again, fall seeding date, can, can play a big role too in how much biomass production we have. So kind of in summary, uh, yeah, planting green, it, you know, it can result in greater, bio, greater biomass and coverage, but it does carry more risk. Uh, in general, there is less risk with soybean, planting uh, green and soybean than corn. If, you, if this is something that you wanna try out, I would certainly recommend trying it first in soybean before you jump into corn, just a lot more risk with, with a corn situation. Um, definitely have a termination plan in place. You know, we've used chemical termination. Um, I know some areas they'll try with roller crimper. I haven't looked at that. I'm not sure if we have much research, and that's one, something we could maybe look at in this round table as well. Uh, but again, you know, have, make sure you have a termination in plan in place. And if you're using herbicides, you don't want it to get away from you either. You know, that cover crop where it gets too hard to control. Make sure you're scouting for insect and disease issues. Uh, watch your hybrid selection if you do want to try this in corn. Uh, if you want to plant green, I would not recommend, uh, you know, doing a conventional hybrid necessarily because, you know, the BT traits, they can help reduce risk from a number of pests that can be uh, increased with planting green. So, again, just looking at managing risk. Um, adapt to weather conditions as needed. You know, if it's a really dry year, probably going to want to get that cover crop terminated earlier before it starts to, you know, compete too much with your cash crop for moisture. And make sure you're consulting with your crop insurance person as well to make sure that you're in compliance with everything there too. So with that, um, I do want to put in a plug again. Thanks, uh, Sarah, for helping support this project and this field day today. Uh, we do have a survey. I've got the link up here, and I think we'll get that in the chat box as well. It's a real short survey. We would really appreciate your feedback on this field day uh, today, but we're also asking for your input on, you know, like what kind of research and educational efforts would you uh, like us to be looking at as well? Because again, that's where we get a lot of our ideas of what to do um, is, is certainly from everybody, you know, the needs that people have too. So um, with that, I will turn it back to you, Ryan. All right, thanks a lot, Liz. And, and like she said, uh, if you look at the chat function or the chat window on your, on your screen there, uh, Phyllis posted that link to the survey. And so if you want to just open that and click that link, you open a window, you can finish after we're done with our roundtable discussion, you can uh, maybe click and fill that out. I know some people were leaving some comments with, uh, about needed work and such. And so please take some time and fill that in today. Uh, I do see now that Anna Cates has joined uh, the discussion. Again, she's a soil health specialist. She hasn't presented here yet today, uh, but there she is. Uh, she is going to join now the roundtable discussion. I want to take one brief second and actually share my screen. I'm going to jump back to the question that Ethan can, hopefully everybody can see that. Now that I can't see her. Ethan was uh, asked early in the, uh, in the session here, um, about planning date with the MDA project. So this is again that project getting at uh, 
you know, how to cover crops function in terms of uh, a weed management tool. And uh, here's a picture actually from, I haven't downloaded yet, um, but I emailed from my phone to myself here. Uh, this was actually, Ethan, the, the May 8th uh, picture here. Uh, this was a day where we sampled biomass at Rochester from the various plots. And then uh, this is a picture here of Matt planting. Uh, this is a, an enlist variety of soybeans right into the cover crop. And then he came back later uh, in the afternoon then and, uh, and put on that uh, termination spray after planting, which in this case, according to my notes here, is, was uh, the maximum rate of glyphosate uh, the product we're using, I think, was 48 ounces plus two pints of Enlist One product. So, uh, very robust system. But uh, and I know the other sites it was managed in a similar way. Uh, they may have harvested uh, the day before and then planted and sprayed the day after. But it was all in that kind of May um, six, seven, eight kind of time frame. So very timely planting this year. Uh, I just thought that was kind of an interesting picture. I. I knew I had taken one, so I thought I'd share that with you guys. Um, again, eventually I get all that stuff downloaded and over to you, so you have some, some photos of that. And I know we've got some video at that site too. So uh, that said, uh, one of the big points of discussion here or questions was um, kind of this interceding rye into, into B5 stage corn. The question itself is, uh, you know, what is the best herbicide program uh, to use in that kind of situation, but maybe we want to try to address that question, but also broaden out that discussion into um, interceding cover crops into corn and and, uh, and and talk a little bit more about that uh, in terms of uh, success, failure, that kind of thing, as well as some of the herbicides and, and how, how that might play a role in this. Axel, do you want to take a shot at that or? Yeah, sure. Well, uh... So the question was, uh, what is our herbicide uh, strategy? Is that right? Yeah. Okay, well, um, a couple of things before I, I jump into, into this and probably Greg and the others can help me. Well, first, I am not a, a wheat scientist person, but uh, uh, most of what we do, uh, we use a glyphosate, basically. We use uh, glyphosate-resistant uh, corn and soybeans, and that's how we manage our crops. But I've read that uh, Sharpen and Resolve, which are two herbicides, uh, are quite good at uh, using, uh, you know, when you are having this type of um, cover crops that we, are, we were showing today. So uh, specifics on how to use those two herbicides, I don't have, maybe, um, Greg can, can, can jump to that. Maybe Ryan can jump to it. <laughs> My mental bandwidth on herbicides, Quagmire, is limited. <laughs> well, but so, what I wanted to say, I'm sorry, is that I, I'm really glad that you guys, Ethan, presented this, uh, this initial work because pretty much whenever we talk about cover crops, one of the first questions that, questions that comes is, um, with control using using cover crops and the the truth is we have very little about that in minnesota in other states i know that they have a lot of work that has been done but uh you guys uh, are kind of pioneering this this area with this with this study that ethan showed today that that is good yeah and there's yeah. Um, well before the herbicide i know um you know, our biggest problem, I, th I think everybody realizes up here, is just that we don't put on the biomass needed to really suppress a lot of those, uh, a lot of those um, weed species. Now, having said that, it seems like we're getting pretty good suppression uh, of those early emergers, you know, the, the ragweeds and such. And we've seen that in the, the, the brassicas as well as the rise. Um, and it's like Liz was saying, it's, it's trying to keep that cover in the system as long as you can. Um, but, you know, we're constrained in some ways, you know, when we talk about rye, you know, we were targeting boot stage on rye uh, to, to uh, you know, and, and we terminated everything at that point. It's probably not optimum for the other species, but, um, you know, I think we're getting some fairly good early merging you know, suppression, early merging species. 
And I'll just and, add, and I listened to a panel of really experienced farmers talk about this question for about 20 minutes yesterday. So I think it is just a moving target depending on what your weed pressure is and what your herbicide program is. Mm -hmm. That is true, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so just from a purely, I'm gonna step out here a little bit. We didn't present results on this today, but we did a kind of a small trial for two years in Rochester looking at establishing a, a cover crop, just a mix of cover crops, uh, three different species in, in terms of what kind of influence uh, our pre-emergence herbicide programming corn would have on establishing cover crop at V5. We also integrated a component in that trial where we were either incorporating or not incorporating the cover crop seed. And for that, we were using a, a little stem inter row cultivator. So it's one of these rolling cultivators. You can drive at fairly high speeds and sort of works to mix the seed into the soil. And we we're looking at trying to figure out the impact of these different factors on, you know, how how we might influence or get better results with cover crop when we're when we're really relying on and, and focused on using some of these pre-emergence herbicide programs. And the two years, the one year, uh, we didn't get good survival of the cover crop. We had great establishment, um, regardless of pre-emergence herbicide program. Um, we had some pretty robust uh, things. You mentioned sharp, and that was one element that was kind of our, uh, you know, our, our least robust. We had a control, and then that one, and then we had some some pretty uh, much more significant in terms of their their ability to do weed control. And so we incorporated those. Uh, those different herbicide products, and we didn't really didn't see an impact on establishment of the cover crop, but in the first year of the study, then we didn't have the cover crop at the end of the season. So at harvest time, we really, the corn out competed the, the cover crop. And so we didn't have a, a cover crop there over winter and, and kind of look at how it fared through the winter. Um, the next year, you know, uh, we, it was last year, we had a very, very wet year, again, saw no impact on cover crop and uh, we all did fine um, regardless of the system. I'd say establishment was probably better where we incorporated it, uh, if I remember those results correctly. But again, it didn't look like these from a just a purely management standpoint that the pre-emergent herbicides were having a terribly great impact on, on our ability to do establish a cover crop. It was more, you know, that year where we had really great corn growth and a really great yield that kind of uh, did bad for the cover crop. They, they just didn't survive through the season. And the following year where our corn yields were a little bit more limited, again, established a cover crop, had great cover crop. Um, and so it's kind of a, you know, certainly an area where we need to do more work. And that's just from a, a management standpoint. Like I wanna use cover crops where I'm using pre-emergent herbicides and planting the corn. Uh, you know, I know, Liz, you've done some more work with um, kind of the, the legality of that or some of the concerns people have with uh, uses they may want to have for the biomass that's developed in the cover crop and herbicides and some of the limitations as far as, you know, restrictions and whatnot for planting and, and, and use and whatnot. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's, there's like no cookie cutter recipe answer to that question, you know, cause you got to look at like what cover crop do you want to plant? And I, I noticed that the question talks about interseeding rye. So are you talking cereal rye or, or annual rye grass too? Because, you know, annual rye grass can handle the shading better than the cereal rye, but cereal rye is one of our more tolerant species to most herbicides that we use. Um, there has been a lot of work done like in, uh, well, I shouldn't say a lot of work, but there's been work done, you know, in, in uh, Wisconsin and Missouri and Penn State, uh, Michigan too, uh, has looked at um, the impact of, you know, residual herbicides on, on cover crops. But a lot of the times it's on fall seeded cover crops, you know, the inner seeded that just shortens up that window. Uh, so you have, you know, higher amount of residual, but yeah, like Axel said, the sharpen that has, you know, you can plant right back in into it after, after that. So you've, you've, you've just got to look at, does the herbicide have soil activity? Uh, you know, how long a residual does it have? You have better chance with a broadleaf herbicide with a grass cover crop, you know, and, you know, a grass herbicide with a broadleaf cover crop, you know, vice versa like that. But uh, we do have information on our, on our extension cover crops website about this too, if you want to check that out and, and links to 
links to uh, some of those nice resources. I, I know I've got to get that stuff updated too, but something like annual ryegrass, if that's really what you're asking about too, that is one of the more sensitive ones and the work that I've seen so far and that they're really um, the main herbicides that we'd use for something like with water hemp, they do a number on annual ryegrass. <laughs> so, you know, if you wanted to try that, you'd look at, you know, higher seeding rates. Don't, re don't cut rates though on your herbicide. We wouldn't recommend that because that's a great way to select for herbicide resistant weeds. So. But. All right. Um, so we've got another question uh, here. Uh, they're asking about brassica and some of the phytotoxic or maybe more uh, allelopathic qualities of brassicas. And and can, can, you, can you repeat your question? Uh, Ryan, I didn't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, probably it's my volume. Go ahead, sorry. Okay, yeah. So the question is about brassicas and phytotoxic qualities or uh, maybe allelopathic uh, qualities of brassicas. And when in the season are they active and how active are they? And, and maybe if anyone would want to uh, address that issue. Well, see. Yeah, well, I can start. Uh, well, we, we are using two. I was talking about two, two brassicas. One is uh, winter camelina and the other one is field pennycress, both uh, over winter in our conditions. Uh, and I say winter camelina because we have spring camelina as well, and they are quite different. Uh, winter camelina needs um, at least some eight uh, weeks of uh, really very cold temperature to vernalize and then uh, flower next season and produce the, the, the grain we want. Camelina is uh, actually, the literature uh, tells us that uh, Camelina has some uh, allelopathic effects, but uh, usually the, the, this allelopathic effect is uh, related to other crops that are small seeds as well. I haven't found myself because I've been looking at several times uh, allelopathic effects of camelina on corn and soybeans. Basically, uh, there is not much in the people who does, does, does those type of studies they say that it's because corn and soybeans have a big seed. So basically there is no effect, okay? That's camelina. Um, when it comes to field pennycress in the processing, the meal that, uh, you know, the byproduct of uh, the, the, the pennycress uh, processing for biofuel uh, is supposed to have high, high glucosinolate, uh, glucosinolate content. And this uh, product, it seems like inhibits the growth of some crops as well. There are some people who go a little bit farther and say that uh, since that happens, uh, we might be able to use that, uh, uh, that uh, byproduct, you know, as a to control weeds, but I don't think I will go that far. So there is a little bit of that, but not much. So that's what I have. Uh, what else? What was the second part of the question? When do they grow? What, what is the thing? Well, the what point in the season would that be active? Oh, okay. Well, since both are uh, uh, winter hard crops, so we plant them sometimes in the, in the end of the summer or beginning of the of the fall, basically between mid September to mid to end September, and uh, the fall growth is minimal. Basically, there is not much there. But similar to other cover crops or other winter crops, uh, if you seed it, uh, you know not later than let's say the 20th of September, you will probably have a better chances of getting those crops, you know, to seed grain production by the end of June. So, which means that most of what, most of the growth that comes with those two crops occurred um, in the spring and beginning of the summer. So that's when everything happens, basically. You just use the fall to, to get them established. Anna, do you have anything to add with qualities of various cover crops and you know, leulopathic, not to push on the spot or anything, but see if you have any experience or comments you want to add? Uh, just to bring up, you know, people often uh, bring up the allelopathy of cereal rye on the subsequent cash crop. and. It looks like, according to the research, most of that is due to nitrogen deficiency, not allelopathic chemicals. So I would say that pay attention to keeping your starter nitrogen up if you're following um, cereal rye with corn. Hey, can I interject something here quick, Ryan? Yep. Um, 
I think people are trying to get into the survey. And again, you'll have to, we're having some technical difficulties with the survey. It worked fine when we ran it through, but um, it's not working right now. So we'll, we'll get, if, if you haven't been able to get through with that, we'll send out another link and a follow-up email with that. So again, sorry for that, but it's all a learning process for everyone <laughs> too. So. It looks anyway. like Phyllis has posted a new comment there in the chat box. So she may have gotten it fixed. Maybe she got, yeah. It, it's, Wait, no, that's a link to the cover crop. Sorry, that's a cover crop. It looks crop like something's page. going on even with, we did it through Qualtrics and she hmm. can't, even, you know, we can't even get logged into that right now, so. <laughs> We'll get it figured out and it'll come out in an email. Oh, if somebody it's not said in it works box, if you so. type in address by hand. Okay. But yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> but we'll get it figured out. All right. So if you do have more questions or comments uh, for the discussion here, we do have uh, a couple of comments, I guess, from. Uh, oh, actually, here's a question, guys. Uh, please discuss a little bit more on nutrient cycling and nitrogen in terms of when the decomposed cover crops release nitrogen. Does it work on different spring termination dates and subsequent nitrogen release? Yeah, well, that is a very good question and uh, probably is the most difficult thing. And uh, we've been talking about that with uh, Greg actually a couple of days ago. We've done something regarding that part. This is the nitrogen transfer we would like to see from cover crops going back into, into our agroecosystem. So we will get uh, the most we can from those cover crops. Uh, this is what uh, we have seen well first, uh, you know, when we terminate a cover crop and that residue is going to become eventually an organic matter and then we're going to have uh, nitrogen release as nitrate, which is, you know, the uh, mineralization uh, process. That happens due to several reasons. Uh, uh, some of the most important are the, the, are the microbes in the soil, then the soil temperature and moisture. Those are the three most important things that combine makes make the you know the release of uh, nitrogen back into the system. Okay, that being said, uh, we've seen that uh, the the mineralization of uh, nitrogen from the cover crops tissue peaks at around 35 to 45 days after termination, but that's for for just uh, two years of research. And uh, it, that depends on when you terminate the cover crop actually, because if you terminate a little bit late, that means that the conditions are going to be probably warmer and eventually wet enough, right? So if that happens, so probably that mineralization is going to peak a little bit earlier. Regardless, I would say that uh, within the first 60 days, most of the nitrogen from the uh, cover crops tissue is being mineralized already. Not that goes down, but it, it reaches a peak and then starts to go down slowly. But the mineralization continues all the way through almost the end of the season to the end of August, actually. That's what we have seen so far. Uh, we've done that with uh, Camelina Pennycress, uh, Winner Rye, and um, in a combination of Winner Rye with other cover crops. And it's more or less the same pattern. Good to know. Uh, I do see now that uh, it does look like Phyllis has a new link into the chat box for uh, filling out that survey. And again, uh, if anyone does have more questions or would like to have uh, some point of discussion, if you type that in the Q&A box, uh, we can get it, uh, put that out there and address it. Otherwise, uh, it looks like we may be coming to the end of our session here today. There are some comments in the chat box about bringing this research up to Northwest Minnesota. And I wanted to address that. Lindsay Pease and I have been trying to fund some cover crop research up there and we've had middling success so far. I would say that um, some really good partners up there though are the soil and water conservation districts. There's uh, Becker and East Otter Tail, West Polk and Wilkin County all have a lot of work going on cover crops. So if you're interested in seeing what's happening with cover crops in Northwest, I would contact those local SWCDs. They have demo plots and cooperators they're working with and could give you a lot of on the ground experiential information. But we are working towards doing the research up there too, because that matters also. 
Yeah, and um, I wanted to, to, to comment on that as well, Anna. Thanks for bringing that up. Uh, yes, there is uh, already some research going on in the Northwest with uh, cover crops, as Anna mentioned. Actually, I, I heard about uh, Anna and uh, Lindsay Pease's uh, study. Uh, I don't know if you guys are working with uh, sugar beets, but uh, people is planting cover crops early in the season and then somehow they terminate before somewhere in the early in the season and then cover, uh, uh, sugar beets take over and that's how it works, I guess. But uh, I wanted to mention that um, in regions where we have some limitations with rainfall, cover crops become eventually an issue as well for crops like corn and soybeans. So people have to be a little bit careful with that and the termination time is becomes even much more important because in that case, uh, water in the soil profile. So Northwest Minnesota is right on the border probably of having enough water for cover crops, um, depending mm -hmm. on the year. Uh, they are though in a small grains region. When you have small grains, you have a much better uh, opportunity for establishing cover crops, at least in that year. Excellent. Well, uh, with that, it looks like we're short on Q and A. And so uh, I wanna thank everyone for attending today. Again, uh, this will be posted in probably a week or so onto the Cover Crops webpage once everything's transcribed and, and produced or whatnot. So uh, if uh, you know someone that didn't get a chance to tune in today and they want to see it, uh, that resource will be available. Uh, but I do want to thank for those that have uh, made time to attend today. Thank you for attending, as well as thank our speakers for uh, providing their insight and their presentations, and Anna for joining us here at the, the Q&A and discussion portion of today's program. So. Thanks everyone. And uh, with that, we're gonna sign off.